I have some more terrible smartwatches. These are the expensive ones. These come in boxes. These showed up while I was doing the previous video. They're more of the same class of device, except slightly more expensive. This one was four dollars. This one was six and a half. So let's take a look and start with the cheap one. On the top we see it is a watch smart. It is sweat proof. It is sports gear. It has a heart rate sensor, a step sensor, a blood pressure sensor, and a reminder to be sedentary. I suspect all of those are lies. The image here is in fact deceptive. It looks like it's an old-fashioned LCD, but it's not. It's got a TFT similar to the LT716, which for comparison is here. On the back, we have, underneath the annoying stickers, the product specifications, where it says that the chip GPU is an ARM32 Cortex-M0, that I'm pretty sure is a lie, it has 64 megabytes of ROM RAM, that I also think is a lie, and a 240x240 240 display. That one might be correct. We'll have to see. Down here is a list of features. I suspect that under the sticker it all says yes. Weather alarm, messaging, etc. Bluetooth music, remote notifications, all the usual stuff that will be no doubt very cheaply and shoddily implemented. In fact, I have opened this up to charge it and I took a look and that is exactly what it is. I also looked up the barcode here and there are no matches. So let's open it up. What do you get? Well, this way up. Inside the plastic box, we have a user manual, which is in fact exactly the same user manual that came with the LT716. We have the watch itself, that is an engagingly chunky plastic thing until you notice that the engagingly chunky buttons on the side are in fact moulded into the plastic and are not part of it. Likewise, the Torx bolts that apparently hold it together are also, you know, moulded in. I do wonder how you get it open. You get two halves of the watch band and you get a bit of plastic. The way it's supposed to work is that you plug these in to form the watch band and then you can put it on your wrist. You charge it by plugging this amazing USB connector into USB like this. And it comes to life. And the first thing you notice as an actual human is that despite the fact that it's got a round screen, and in fact the AliExpress listing showed a nice round image, the screen is square. This thing is an absolute fingerprint magnet, but I can actually see in the camera viewfinder, you can see the square screen here. Okay, how does it work? It's not a touch screen, it works just like the LT716. There's a capacitive sensor here, and you... Oh wow! With it lined up for the camera, I can't actually see the screen at all. That's... Okay, I'm just going to have to stare at the camera viewfinder, which may, might make this a bit incoherent. Luckily there's only one control. So you get your watch face, you can step through various things. It works just the same as the LT716, except with more terrible graphics. Let me find the more page. Sleep sensor, weather, camera, looking for reset. QR code to get Fit Pro, and the About page, and this is interesting because it looks just like the About page on this. The version number is slightly different. This is an LF, sorry, LP715, 
rather than LT716, but it is clearly the same software stack, which means it's probably the same hardware inside. Let me find the, here we go, the heart rate sensor. This bond's always entertaining. Yep, it's a blinking green light. And just like the LT716, it lies. One thing that is surprisingly hard to get on camera, but you should be able to see, is that the screen on this one is noticeably lower resolution than the little screen on the LT716. When it stays on. Before I open it up, you know it has to be done. Okay, let's try and open this thing up. Now there is a seam that runs around here. So I'm assuming if I stick a spudger in and lever, something will happen. I have not opened this. This is the very first time. So your guess is as good as mine. What will be inside? Uh, let's try this out. Come on. I don't want to chew it up too badly. Yeah, it looks like there are clips at the corners. There you go. What's inside this thing? Well, the case is as expected. It's exactly the same as the LT716 case. Here we have a screen. A little metal thing for the capacitive contact. Ooh. Oh, yes. I must have somehow set it to a different watch face. That's the one shown on the box. What watch faces are there? Whether a camera looking for reset. Interesting. The LT716, the theme menu was on the watch face. Long press? Ah, long press toggles between themes. And yeah, it's only got the two. Okay, I assume that this levers up. I think it's stuck down. Yes, it is. Oop, I don't want to do that. Uh, that was actually splitting the the back of the screen off the diffuser. Let's try that. I don't think this screen is very well made. There we go. Oh, doesn't that look familiar? Yeah, it is not the same PCB that was in the LT716, but it is closely related. The position of these pads is different. I don't know what TM and EN are. Test and enable. On this side, most of the interesting stuff is under the sticky pad that held the screen down. Well, that is the sticky stuff removed, revealing some more pads and a model name, which is LP715 version 1.3. What I don't see is an SWS pad. Let's try and take this thing out.
I had to take a photo to get a good look at the chip, but it seems it is not a TLSR thing. It's a PHY 608-22 something or other, which is interesting. So maybe it's not binary compatible with the LT716. Inside the case, we have a vibrator unit, a bigger and probably cheaper one than the LT716, and the usual tiny little battery, which is unlabeled. Okay, let's put it back together again. Oh, <laughs> that's that's interesting. OK, it's working now. Right, anyway. OK, let's take a look at this one. Again, it is unbranded, it just says smartwatch. And on this side, it has even less information. It is black and it is made in China. Nothing else. What do you get? Well, you'll immediately notice that the manual is bigger. Okay, let's take a look at the hardware. You get a USB charging cradle, a watch band, and the thing itself. Now this is interesting. It is noticeably better made than the others. It's still plastic, possibly plastic, possibly plastic, but it is much heavier and much more solid. The top probably isn't glass, but it feels like it. It has a knob on the side, but no other obvious controls. And however, unlike the other one, if I push the button, push the button, it's supposed to be charged. There we go. This has a touch screen. However, if you look at the icons and the font, it is very clearly the same software stack as the other one. So let me walk you through the menu items. Uh, you press the button to turn it on. You tap once to get to the menu and you swipe up and down. Now, if you go to dialer, this is an actual phone dialer and this shows it really is a touch screen and it feels like a capacitive one. It's actually not bad. It's got the usual selection of stupid sports stuff, the usual weather stuff, just like the other one, the usual stupid music player, although this being a touch screen is at least much easier to use. And that one. If you go to more about, we get a very similar looking about page revealing that this is an LY737. So it's clearly the same family of device as the other two. We have a Siri thing there that does nothing, a backlight thing. Oh, this lets you change the screen timeout, which is nice. Facebook and Twitter, none of which do anything. QR code. If you swipe left and right on the main screen, this changes between the watch faces. This is the default one, which is kind of terrible. Then there's this one, which is kind of terrible. There's this one, which is also kind of terrible. And there's this. I don't know why this exists. Moving on before it haunts my dreams. We have this, which is also terrible, but is at least something you can live with if you like analog dials. And then you're back to here. If you swipe up, you get to a quick menu, 
which lets you go to the dialer. A thing which I don't know what it is. Phone book. A menu to let you change the menu style, of which there are several. This is one. Does this remind you of anything? It would work better if it was slightly higher frame rate. But they are clearly trying quite hard to copy a certain well-known smartwatch vendor's user interface. Now I need to figure out how to get it back again. There we go. Style 2 is this one. Style 3 is simple icons. Put that back to 2. Music player. Step counter. The fact that this is saying zero steps makes me think it might not be completely fake. And quick button to the QR code. And that's about all the features this thing has. Oh, uh, one very important thing I haven't demonstrated. The heart rate sensor. Yes, it's more flashing green lights. And despite the nice art, it does not display a graph of your heart rate, and it just makes up all the numbers. One thing which doesn't do anything is the dial. I'm not sure if it's just not hooked up to anything or whether it doesn't actually, you know, operate as a rotating dial. But the only way to find that out is to open it up. Look at all that stuff. This is a complex thing. And look, you actually have a labeled battery. It says it's 200 milliamp hour. That's the ribbon cable to the screen, which I notice is not plugged in all the way, but the screen does seem to work. This will be the connector to the capacitive touch screen. I don't know what this is for. It could well be the fake heart rate sensor. That's the vibrator. That could be the CPU, but I think it's more likely the CPU is on the bottom. If so, this makes this thing substantially more complicated if it actually has two chips on it. There's even got a screw fasting the PCB in. And there's an unpopulated thing here that I can't quite make out from my angle. This is the button. And yes, it's a very simple tactile button that does not go round. Let's see if I can get that PCB out and have the thing still work afterwards. This is all fraught because this thing is live. Yes, this cable is for the fake heart rate sensor and also the button. There's a thing here. I think this could have an actual microphone. Ah, and there's a, another screw under there. This metal thing that's underneath is stuck down.
you know what? I think this metal thing is the vibrator. And I think that is a microphone. And that thing around there is a speaker. I think this has actual voice capabilities. What I don't see here is any kind of CPU. So that tiny chip on the other side must be the CPU. Okay, I don't think I'm going to get anywhere if I take this apart further other than breaking things. Uh, I could pull it out onto a breakout board, but I don't want to do that at this point. So I am going to try and put this back together again. So here it is, thankfully still working. Now this is potentially quite a nice device. Loudspeaker, microphone, an actual touch screen. The viewing angle of the screen is bad, but it functions. It's reasonably well made. It's got a decent sized battery. I need to find out what CPU this thing has. I didn't get a good look at it during the teardown. So I think I was actually a bit premature about sticking the screen back on and I'm going to take it off again and put this under the microscope. So here are those two chips I was looking at. A CST 816D and a whatever that is. There's a unpopulated thing here and opposite it is this unpopulated thing here that I spotted earlier. I think these are for buttons or knobs. The actual knob, this, is just a simple tactile switch on this little daughter board. You can see the flex cable there only has like two wires. So I think that what these are for, that one and that one, are for quadrature encoder turnable knobs. Load a different firmware package onto the same board put it in a different case, and you get a much more upmarket device. Here's the dodgy connector to the screen, but I'm not going to touch it because it does seem to work. But I am going to spin it around disorientingly and fold the screen out of the way because under it is another chip. A YC1133 EQ1528. Next to it, there is a clock crystal at 24 megahertz, so I think this is the CPU. That makes this a three CPU device, which is pretty high end for these cheap smartwatches. It's also worth noting, this is the battery, that the battery does seem to have a actual over voltage protection circuit, which is nice. I was unable to tell whether the little batteries in the watches had one or not. I went and looked up some data sheets. Let's start with the cheap watch because I kind of owe it an apology because it really is a ARM Cortex M0. It's actually quite a nice one. This chip has 64K of RAM, a variable amount of flash. The one I've got has half a megabyte a onboard ROM which contains the Bluetooth stack and a lot of other useful utilities, and a bootloader which, if I find it, allows you to reflash it from a serial port so you don't need to fiddle about with JTAG and SWD debugging, which by the way it also has. This is quite a decent chip. It's got the usual million different features such as SPI, I squared C, UART, analog and digital audio input. And you can use the PWM functionality, which if I can find it, here it is, to do audio output. It's also got keyboard support. Although of course this particular watch only has a single button. So this is kind of wasted and you know, no microphone or loudspeaker. Looking at the I.O. pins, we have a pin here marked test mode, which is probably the TM pin that we saw on the PCB. And I suspect that the others are wired to various other programming pins. However, I don't know what test mode actually does. The documentation here doesn't mention it. The 
bottom four pins seem to be used for both JTAG and arm style SWD, although here they are labeled SDW. But that's nice because even without using the bootloader, this means that I should be able to just plug in one of my cheap knockoff ARM debuggers and make it work. The chip is made by Phi Plus, a Chinese company out of Shanghai, which I've actually been to. They have a relatively flashy looking website from which you can download the SDK, except the website is largely broken and there are no download links. If you go to the Chinese version, there is an entry in this table, which you also cannot download. Plus the various links to things like the ecosystem don't work. Support doesn't work. At least that's a wiki and so on. Luckily, there is a copy of the SDK, which has been dumped onto GitHub. It only works with Keel, but I have found someone who's managed to port most of it to GCC. The problem is the SDK itself, if I find a file, is full of lawyer bombs. This is confidential. You are not allowed to use this unless you're deploying it in one of these devices, which all makes it complicated to work with for open source software. And of course, just to make life more complicated, because a large proportion of the software stack is actually on ROM, then just linking a simple binary blob and running it isn't going to work. You need to be aware of all the memory locations that the ROM code is going to use so that your application doesn't step on it. From poking around at the examples, it looks like, let me find one, uh, let me find a simple one. Let's just go to button, source, main. This initializes your application and you notice that this is just calling operating system functions. Your actual application is a event driven thing which is called into by the operating system. In fact, that's not doing anything. Now, here we go. Yeah, it's using callbacks rather than a simple event loop. But the other example I looked at does use a event loop. But all in all, I think this is fairly straightforward to work with. The Tuya Internet of Things platform supports it. And in fact, there is quite a lot of useful information about how to do stuff like flashing and so on. A lot of this pinout stuff is specific to this particular development board, which unfortunately is not the device I have, but this does reference things like, where is it? This screenshot is for a tool called Phi Plus Kit that actually does the flashing via the UART. It seems to work the usual way in that you reset the board, the bootloader runs, this tool pings the bootloader before it has a chance to run your application, and then it can just control everything. Actually finding a copy of Phi Plus Kit is left as an exercise for the reader. Let's move on to the other watch. Starting with the smallest, the 9212, I have no idea what it is. I haven't been able to find any information. There just isn't enough written on the top of the chip. It's probably something really boring like a audio amplifier. The middle sized one, however, is a capacitance chip. It runs the touchscreen and it is honestly not that interesting. Moving on, the CPU is a Yai chip YC1133. There's not a lot of information on these, but it's another ARM-based BLE system on a chip. This one is interesting because it's actually dual core. The other core is a, quote, risk core, unquote, which means it's probably some proprietary thing, which handles all the protocol layer of stuff. Like the other chip, it's also got a 96K of ROM, plus some dedicated RAM. 
So it basically runs its own operating system and does all your Bluetooth stack stuff. I assume that this one, the application processor, calls it to get stuff done, which is great. Like the other chip, it means that your Bluetooth stack doesn't have to take up valuable application space. And the fact that this one has its own RAM is even better. This one has slightly less RAM, 56K, plus a cache of 16K for the flash emulation via SPI, which is fairly par for the course for this kind of thing. This one also supports PS RAM, as well as USB stuff and an SD card interface, which is interesting. Normally you just hook those up to the SPI bus. Unfortunately, that's where the good news ends. This is basically everything I managed to find on it, which is not a lot. In order to get at any more information and the SDK and stuff like that, you have to sign up to UiChip's developer program, which I have, or at least I've sent them an email, and I don't honestly expect them to answer, but we'll see. Unlike the other chip, this one does not seem to have SWD or JTAG, or at least it's not mentioned here. It does have this ICE pin, which I can't highlight. Let me find the actual pinout list. This one, which is the debug port. It looks like it's a proprietary single wire debug system, which is a bit of a shame. However, chances are, this is wild speculation, that whatever OS the data processor is running probably acts as a bootloader for the ARM. So it may be possible to use this to flash the rest of the system, but there's no information here on that. Comparing the two systems, the second watch is clearly better made and more sophisticated. I mean, it's got a touchscreen and the CPU in it, this one, is more powerful strictly. The application processor on this only has 56K, where the other one had 64, but it's not having to share that with the Bluetooth stack. Because in this one, the Bluetooth stack runs in the data processor, which has its own dedicated RAM. However, the other watch seems to be much simpler and easier to work with and has useful test pads for doing useful things with. So I think that one might be a better candidate for hacking. Either way, I was totally expecting both of these watches to just use exactly the same hardware as in the original LT716. That is the Telink proprietary TC32 CPU. Wish they're not. These are both excellent small processors. There's a lot of stuff you can do with these. 56K is tons of memory for running MicroPython. The other one, you get 48K after the operating system has taken its cut. This is enough that you'd probably be able to run the Bluetooth stack. So you'd end up with a proper MicroPython powered Bluetooth smartwatch, which is very cool. Now, I was going to leave it there and improvise some kind of conclusion. However, I had to take this thing apart to get the microscope shots of the chip in the last shot. And while doing so, I accidentally broke it. The flex connector where it joins the PCB is no longer making good contact. It's a little hard to demonstrate, but if I squeeze here, there we go, the screen lights up. If I don't put pressure on the flex connector, then it doesn't light up. Let me. And of course, it actually tries to turn the screen off a bit. You see it's flickering because it's not making good contact. And it's been getting gradually worse. It used to be that if I squeezed it and pressed the button, it would actually produce an image, but it doesn't anymore. What will have happened is that there's an edge there which hinges like that but it's not really supposed to. And I bet that where the solder meets the flex connector, that's cracked and is no longer making good contact. I'm sure this is fixable if I knew how, but I don't, which basically means that this device is now useless as a watch because the screen won't work. However, this does open up an interesting possibility. If I take the screen off completely, it becomes much easier to reverse engineer. 
I wasn't actually planning on doing this because I wanted this to be a quick short video, but let's give it a try and see what happens. And that's where it all disappointingly peters out because I have got nothing useful from this board. Desoldering the screen was easy enough. It just took a little bit of work with the hot air gun and it came right off. From there, I was able to solder wires onto the various test pads and then I hooked it all up to another of my surplus PCBs here. Unfortunately, the next step, which was beeping out which pad was connected to which pin of the CPU, was both incredibly difficult because the circuitry on this thing is much smaller than on the LT716. There should be B-roll footage here showing what I was trying to work with. But the pin assignment just doesn't really make any sense. The RX and TX lines are not connected to the bootloader's UART. They are connected to a couple of random GPIOs. The bootloader UART itself, the TX and RX lines are bridged together and connected to EN here, which doesn't really make any sense and renders them useless for bootloader purposes. TM is connected to the test mode line, so that's something. And I have discovered that if I raise this high, the system doesn't start up. But yeah, I have no idea what's going on here. The one interesting thing I found is that if I pull the power and restart it from cold, this light, this green one, goes on for a few seconds. That's the heart rate sensor. It goes on dimly. I checked this with the oscilloscope and it is actually being set to a low voltage rather than there being some kind of serial data on that pin. This is most likely to be bootloader related. Either the bootloader is deliberately setting that pin to that state for some reason of its own and then the firmware resets it when it starts up a few seconds later, or the pin happens to be initialized to some random value on startup and the bootloader's not touching it. Either way, it does suggest that the bootloader runs for a couple of seconds before the rest of the system starts up, which is interesting. But yeah, this board's a bit of a dead loss. Editor me here. It took me five takes to do that last bit. And on the only take which worked, I once again forgot to mention PVVX, who has done a lot of work in reverse engineering these devices. In particular, one of the things I pulled from PVVX's GitHub repository is a Python tool which is capable of talking to the bootloader on PHY6222 devices and upload to and download from the flash. Just on the off chance that I had managed to misprobe everything, I did hook it up and see if I could make it do anything, which it didn't. But it did show one issue, which is that just like with the LT716, the tooling here wanted access to the reset line. And what you're looking at is microscope footage of me attempting to solder a wire to the very, very tiny component which gives access to the reset line. I failed. So anyway, thank you to PVVX for doing all this work. I wish I had discovered that stuff earlier. And now let's move on to the improvised conclusion. So, conclusion time. In this video and the last one, I have looked at these three watches. Turn that screen back on. Over here we have the LT716. This is an interesting oddity of a device, which I have managed to flash with a corrupted firmware image, which is why it's showing garbage, but it does still work. This is mainly interesting because of its weird CPU. As a watch, it's pretty much useless because of the small battery and the single button. It is potentially interesting as a repurposed other device, but the 16K of RAM is extremely limiting. Over here, we've got the LP715. This is just the empty shell because the rest of it is stuck to my PCB over there. This is a much more powerful device. And if it could be repurposed, this would be genuinely useful. As a watch, it's crippled by having just one button. The small battery is also a big problem. This could very easily be repurposed. This, the LY737. This is nice. This has got decently made hardware. 
it's got a better CPU, it's got a touch screen, it's got microphone and speaker. This would actually make a decent watch. The bigger battery is a huge improvement. I charged this yesterday. I have to have it plugged into a power supply now because it doesn't work anymore. This I charged about a week ago. It's still working. However, I've been focusing and trying to repurpose these things by modifying them, attaching stuff to the debug port so that they can be reflashed. Of these three watches, I've succeeded with one, I failed with another, and I haven't even tried with this one. Modifying them is just hard. If these are going to be repurposed, clearly the thing to do is to find a way to reflash them via Bluetooth over the air so that you can reprogram them without needing to open the case at all. That would be ideal. This will require significant reverse engineering. Luckily, these all use the same application, Fit Pro, so it's very likely that they use the same flash mechanism for over-the-air reprogramming. I have found information from somebody who has attempted to reverse engineer this. This was based on one of these LT716s. They got as far as bricking the device. Less than helpful, but does at least demonstrate that they managed to program something. I think it's highly plausible that with a bit of work, the protocol could be reverse engineered the rest of the way to allow these things to be reflashed completely. Developing a flash image that is capable of being reflashed over the air using the Bluetooth stack will be work. It will require interacting with the SDKs of these watches. I've got the SDK for this one. I've got the SDK for this one. I have not been able to get the SDK for this one, but they're all different. I was completely expecting these to all be the same hardware inside. They are not. Clearly, the cheap and nasty smartwatch scene is much more diverse than I was expecting. Anyway, I am not intending to do any of that, at least not just yet. I am going to put all this lot away and go and work on something else because I am sick of these by now. Still, I hope these made for interesting and potentially entertaining videos. There is so much useful CPU power locked away in these incredibly cheap little devices. It would be great to figure out something cool to do with them. This one in particular, this could be an actual watch. So, calling it there. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video, and please let me know what you think in the comments. And I would say that I'm now going to get some rest, but I have to start video editing. Goodbye.